Thank you, everybody. Um, good evening and a warm welcome to you all. Um, my name's Emma Redding and um, I have the absolute pleasure of serving as the current director of the Victorian College of the Arts. Um, in a moment, I'll introduce the panel of very distinguished speakers. Um, but first, I'd like, and I, I'm speaking on behalf of the panel now, I'd like to um, invite you to acknowledge with us that we are speaking this evening on the lands of the Boonwurrung and Wurundjeri people of the Eastern Kulin Nation. And I'd like us to pay our respects to their ancestors and elders past and present and pay our respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and particularly acknowledge and welcome all First Nations colleagues here this evening. Let's remember that for thousands and thousands of years, where we are sitting right now on these lands, people have been telling their stories, dancing their dances, singing their songs, making, collaborating, meeting. This is the first talk this evening of a series of conversations that form part of the VCA's 50th anniversary celebrations. I joined the VCA because of really what it is and what it stands for and what it can be. And as we contemplate the next 50 years for the VCA, it's really important to review our values and really think about what matters to us and what matters to our students. And so really these last six months while I've been in the role, um, there's been some recurring themes coming out of the conversations I've had with colleagues and students. And those themes have really formed these talks, um, this, the, the next four, four talks. It's no accident though that the topic of this first talk is well-being, front and centre. So as we contemplate um, the next 50 years for, the, for, the, for an art school, what, what should an art school look like and be driving for? Um, it's important to have conversations and to ask questions, to ask difficult questions and to listen. Thank you for showing up. I think the fact that you're all here means that this topic is really important to you too and we look forward to hearing from you later on. So what is the relationship between art and well-being? And how can one who is engaged in art be impacted either negatively or positively in terms of their well-being? So through engaging with art, through seeing art, participating in art, through feeling art. And what about care? A more proactive term. A dear colleague of mine, Natalie King, reminded me the other day that care is a verb to care, it's much more proactive in many ways. How might we take better care of our students? Would artists be better artists if we take better care of them? And what about, of course, learning from indigenous people about caring for country, caring for environment, caring for self and caring for others, which of course is all about caring for our futures. I'm sure you'll agree we've got a fantastic lineup of speakers this evening um, who represent education, research, therapy, and artistic practice. They are all uh, they all have international profiles. Um, I knew of all of them before I came here, and I was so excited to be working with them. And look, I've got them all out this evening. <laughs> so thank you for coming. Um, they are, I'll just introduce you to each each colleague, Jane Davidson, who is Professor of Creative and Performing Arts here at the Faculty of Fine Arts and Music at the University of Melbourne, Fellow of the Australian Academy of the Humanities. Jane has extensive experience as a lecturer, supervisor, mentor and researcher. She chairs the university's Creativity and Wellbeing Hallmark Research Initiative, which investigates what it means for people to achieve wellbeing and how creativity can be harnessed to achieve this aim. Her published work, which is referenced by scholars all around the world, includes Aging and Life Course Inquiry, exploring adaptation across a range of social and cultural contexts. Sue Mays, next to Jane, 
is Director of Artistic Health at the Australian Ballet. Sue is known for her pioneering work in injury prevention research and practice. She has presented at conferences all around the world, including at the International Association for Dance, Medicine and Science. And I have to say, when Sue's presenting at those conferences, people are literally queuing um, out, the, out the room. And um, I have never, fortunately, been programmed next to Sue concurrently in the, in the, uh, the programme, because I don't think anyone would come to my session. Um, but she's also uh, presented a lot at the International Olympic Committee World Conference, um, such as the one in Monaco um, a few years back. She received the Latrobe University Distinct Distinguished Alumni Award in 2018 and has consulted for AFL, Cricket Australia, Tennis Australia, Victorian Institute of Sport, NBL and professional sports teams from overseas. Sue was made a member of the order in 2020. Kat McFerrin, Professor in Creative Arts and Music Therapy and is an international expert on music, music therapy and adolescence. Her research also referenced by people all over the world, investigates healthy and unhealthy uses of music with and by young people and pursues in particular participatory approaches with an emphasis on reflexive qualitative investigations. Kat is currently director of the Researcher Development Unit in Chancellery Research and Enterprise and her previous leadership roles include head of the music therapy program, during a time of significant growth and change and expansion of the Creative Arts Therapy Programme and Associate Dean for Research, Associate Dean for International and Associate Dean for Student Wellbeing. Patricia, Patricia Piccinini is an incredible artist whose work encompasses sculpture, photography, video and drawing. Her practice focuses on the relationship between people and other creatures and the environment and between the artificial and the natural. Her work questions the way that contemporary technology and culture changes our understanding of what it means to be human. Patricia has had solo exhibitions all over the world and just this last year, even though none of us really travelled anywhere, she had exhibitions in Slovenia, San Francisco, Germany and China. Patricia is an enterprise professor here at the VCA, University of Melbourne. And Tiraki Onus. Tiraki is a Yotta Yotta man and head of the Willin Centre for Indigenous Arts and Cultural Development here at the University of Melbourne. He is a successful visual artist, curator, performance artist and opera singer. He's also a filmmaker, though that's not on his bio. And actually coming back from the States on the plane on Sunday, what's in front of me in the... The seat, the, the screen, it's, it's his recent film, Ablaze, which you must see, it's fantastic. So I watched that on the way back. Um, he received the Dame Nellie Melba Opera Trust's Harold Blair Opera Scholarship in 2012 and 2013. In 2015, he was the inaugural Hutchinson Indigenous Fellow at the University of Melbourne. Tiriki's Associate Dean Indigenous and Deputy Dean Place. But above all else, and I'm kind of speaking off script now, he is probably one of the kindest, most sure. generous and open-hearted colleagues I've ever met, with, met and, and worked with. Thank you, Terry. I didn't write that bit, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> so as I say, I knew about all of these wonderful people before coming here. I'm so pleased to have them. Thank you very much for coming and being so generous with your time and sharing what you know around this topic. I don't know what they're going to say. I simply ask them to respond to the question, what is the relationship between art and well-being? I know they'll be very different, which is great. So we'll hear from each speaker just for a few minutes each before moving into a panel conversation and then question and answers from the audience. So I'm going to start with Jane, if that's okay. Sure. Hello, everybody. Um, I had forgotten what my provocation question was, so um, I'm going to forge ahead anyway, and I'm going to begin with the World Health Organization's definition of well-being which is not just the absence of disease or illness. It's a complex combination of a person's physical, mental, emotional, and social health factors. So well-being is strongly associated with happiness and life satisfaction. And in short, I guess well-being could be described as how you feel about yourself and your life. 
So that's a kind of broad embracing concept coming from now. But in fact, that link between well-being and arts practice has been referred to since human records exist and since humans have been on this earth, for sure. And even um, in the 17th century, Francis Bacon and René Descartes, two of the early founders of modern science, viewed creativity as involving the harnessing of the forces of nature for the betterment of the human condition. And so perhaps of all creative activities, the arts are the most pure in their form. And creativity has also been broadly understood in different conceptions and diff different cultures, but some emphasize the process aspects, the doing and the almost everyday aspects of it, whilst others emphasize the novelty and rupture and the huge amount of change that that can bring and the insight that brings. For me, arts represent ourselves, our beliefs, our imagination, and help us to expand possibilities and give us choices. Also to find those small moments of care for others and for ourselves. But of course, they can do the opposite as well. I don't want to say that this story is a completely good one, so I need to be aware of that. And I think Kat will speak more directly to that. During COVID, I think it became an absolute, um, you know, crystal clear example of where arts, care, and um, this interface between well-being and creativity really, really struck us in the university. We were faced with this incredible contradiction of trying to facilitate creative knowledge and exploration and expansion for students while they were facing lockdown, their worlds closing in, their sense of identity being challenged, all those things that lead to well-being. So we held this very uh, tricky balance. And at the same time, I ran a, a large sale, scale study across Australia where we asked people, what are you doing at home during lockdown? And perhaps you won't be surprised to find that creative artistic engagements were the most important thing that people were doing. There was difference between age groups. So younger people tended to refer to and use music more, either listening or playing and older people tended to be doing things that were more based around making. Now, they could be generational differences, and it could be the sample of people we were uh, referring to, but nonetheless, those creative arts activities were the things that people were using for self-care to support themselves through the pandemic. Of course, there's much evidence out there that um, when we're living with degenerative neuro conditions like uh, Alzheimer's disease and dementia, um, working with arts, in particular music, can help us support those conditions, give us a kind of continuous presence, help us remain lucid, give us focus, uh, enhance social interaction and so on. So there are lots of different aspects to how the arts can facilitate well-being. Uh, I am particularly passionate about the role of um, creative engagements, I call them creative artistic engagements, in sustaining cognition through later life. And so as we age, there is a decline, a gradual decline in physical and cognitive capacity. And we find that cognitive reserve can be built through engaging in artistic, the, the evidence base is not huge, but it is there that from childhood, if you engage in those kind of activities, it can help you shore up and sustain. And then as you get older, you start using adaptations in your life to help you continue as long as possible. And artistic engagements can really be of benefit there. We need to understand it more. And I'm currently developing a grant proposal on that very area 
and I feel very strongly about it. Um, I think I've probably talked for five minutes, I'm not sure. The one final example I want to give you, and I, I know there are people here from very, very diverse backgrounds, and I see someone here who is a war veteran and who knows how powerful uh, creative arts can be in kind of mental health recovery and preservation of self-identity and so on. But I did a rather beautiful project a couple of years ago now that was in a workplace. It was in a workplace in Coburg, which is an incredibly culturally diverse suburb we all know and love. And we went into that workplace as a part of professional development for the team. And we asked them what kind of intervention they might like to participate in. And they came up with the idea of having a, a lullaby swap. And we had people from at least six different culture groups present to one another and share their lullabies. It was the most empowering experience for each individual in that room. And they went on of their own volition to develop a workplace choir where they shared lullabies um, for many weeks. And that all culminated in us coming to the Melbourne Recital Centre and giving a performance. And there's a whole other aspect there as well about sharing your process and delivering it to others. So I'll stop there, but with this note that um, as elite um, artists, and particularly those of us in the performing arts where we're singing or dancing or playing an instrument, sometimes these self-care and incredibly positive benefits can go all a little bit haywire, where we can be over-investing, over-relying on some practice habits we have, um, or we can have bad advice from somebody, and we can end up injuring ourselves and giving a lot of harm to the individual, and ultimately to why we originally engaged in a particular art form. So that might be a good segue into you. That's a perfect segue, thank you. <laughs> So yes, I'm talking about um, wellness for artists. So I've been really looking after the wellness for artists, in particular ballet dancers, but more recently um, our Orchestra Victoria for around about 30 years. And I've had the privilege, seeing I've been in the, um, at the ballet for so long, of really seeing an incredible culture change. So when I started, it was really just me and the massage therapist. We were sort of overworked with nearly at that point about 70 dancers. Um, they weren't thinking about life before dance. Their whole identity was wrapped up with being a dancer. They weren't particularly fussed if they were, you know, in a wheelchair when they finished. Um, they weren't thinking of a career after dance and um, they were scared that if they reported an injury that they might lose a performance, lose an opportunity, lose a promotion. And um, they were you know, pushing through a lot of pain. We had lots of surgery and you know, injuries that would potentially definitely impact them in later life. So um, when I started full time with the company back so about 27 years ago, we really um, were very strategic about addressing one sort of small factor at a time. We'd pick the most sort of serious injury that was having the biggest impact and as a team um, really try to delve into, you know, what we could do to prevent that injury. And so what was wonderful um, with the company, because, you know, arts never had much funding, um, but because of these little strategies that we were putting into place, the company then reinvested the savings because we were started to see the benefits. Some um, the dancers were um, not going on, you know, work cover, not losing their careers. So we reinvested that money in an even further program. So over, you know, at least 20 years, we developed this fantastic program that was really um, holistic. Um, we started with looking at um, perhaps, you know, physical injuries, um, building up their strength. Um, one of the things that dancers were really scared about was to sort of get in the gym and do some true strengthening. And we have that same 
um, approach with the, the musicians where um, you know, they were really felt that all they should do is practice, practice, practice. And we could see that by adding in some supplementary um, exercises that really built up some strength. So that was sort of the really beginnings of it. We had such success and I think it was really important to really promote and sort of celebrate those successes because that got even greater interest from people that would, um, you know, give us some funding, which was fantastic. And, um, and then we started to look at wellness and um, nutrition and every facet of um, an artist's needs. And um, now we've got this really um, committed, large multidisciplinary group. Um, but the dancers are, you know, most definitely um, the centre of that group. And I think what we've done really well is to educate them. Um, they really love knowledge and um, just to really give them that knowledge about their own bodies, to give them a toolbox of ideas that they can do to support them. But in the end, it's up to them to choose what that um, looks like. So they have um, particular things they do to start their day, to support their day. They've got little exercises or ideas of things that they can do during the day. And then they've, um, at the end of the day, you know, we've really focused on some good recovery. So. And I think the, we've just, um, over the last couple of years, employed a, what we call a welfare development coordinator who does all the triage for their wellbeing, but also um, really helps them to um, start to think about a career after dance so that um, as soon as they get into the company, they start to you know, think about some subjects that they could do and build up... Um, some experience so by the time they retire or if they get an injury they've got something to fall back on but they also um, we also work on developing their personal skills because they're much more than an, um, just a dancer and um, giving them that sort of identity outside dance then means that if they do lose dance for some reason um, they haven't lost their whole identity and self so I think um, yeah I've been really fortunate to see this huge culture change that um, now we're there then sharing with the rest of the world, um, not just with dance, and certainly um, we've had, um, we're now looking after the orchestra as well. So the musicians are benefiting from it. And um, I think it's fantastic that I see all these little ideas infiltrating through little ballet schools, even sort of in the regional areas. So yeah, it's a thrill to see the word really spreading. Uh, there's so many connections between all of us, I'm sure, uh, so I'll leave that for you all to do. Um, uh, I am the head of the Creative Arts Therapies Program here and I, I want to emphasise, I guess, the therapeutic aspect of that in the context of the other speakers today. So the reason that we have a two years master's program is because our belief is that um, to focus on working with people during the times where they're struggling the most the role of the professional who supports them is to provide safety, structure, compassion, care, and to attend directly to their specific and unique needs of each person and each group of people. And so the role of the arts in that, and the reason that we identify as creative arts therapists, is that it's, it's like a creativity plus all of these different aspects particularly safety and particularly compassion and understanding. So as a creative arts therapist, thinking about the connection between um, my form being music and wellbeing, it's about the relationship that uh, occurs, that holds creative expression in a containing context because uh, using the arts as a medium in which we can discover something about ourselves, um, come to understand the things that are standing in our way and get insight into internal barriers that we might be experiencing, as well as recognising that all people exist uh, in context and that it's not just internal barriers, there's plenty of external barriers that oppress and marginalise different groups of people. Uh, to be able to do that kind of work often requires somebody attending to the, the safety issues. So my research has very much focused on 
how young people use music in helpful and unhelpful ways in their lives. And it was a little devastating when I first started uh, that series of discoveries that led me to say those words, helpful and unhelpful uses of music, because I was fairly um, vocal in my support of young people's rights to access music in whatever ways they wanted. And, and this, this has ma been maintained. But I would also proclaim that they would always be doing good identity work, even if it looked a bit damaging at the time. But in fact, it turns out that, of course, we can use the arts to accompany us in our darkest moments. And sometimes that's to provide us with companionship and other times it motivates us. Music can be very useful for promoting venting, rumination, and, and particularly these kinds of behaviours where music can be quite repetitive when we go around. Anyway, I won't let go on about that too much, but uh, the need therefore to have a professional to care for you during the darkest moments of your life uh, becomes a little more apparent. And so our training course is about how do we understand the different struggles that people have, what are the theories that explain that, and, and what are the methods that we might use to support that. And, you know, during the recent pandemic, again, thinking about what that looks like, uh, the university and students were struggling uh, in the university at that time and, and of course, were lonely and uh, feeling isolated and... Um, there was also a huge call from graduate researchers in particular, PhD researchers in particular, who, uh, for any of you who have done a PhD, is a bit of a hero or epic journey in its own right, where one already struggles and, and faces one's demons, so to speak, in the, in the aspiring to make a discovery that nobody else has made before. It's a lot of pressure. And it's also very solo. And so I decided to establish a program which I think uh, embodies all of the qualities that I'm talking about, where we took the notion of creativity as uh, the guide and my presence as the facilitator to shape and structure it. And I worked together with a group of, I think it was around about 100 um, graduate researchers over a period of six weeks uh, to use music and drama and dance and art to envisage the ver various barriers that people were facing. So I would play a piece of music, for example, to the group and I would say, okay, what's the imagery that comes to you, whether it's visual or embodied or whatever it might be, and how would you describe that? And how does that um, creatively inspired material coming straight from your imagination give you the potential to reflect on where you're at right now. And further to that, that's the basic projection mechanisms, and further to that, if we take uh, an artistic opportunity and intentionally invite our imaginations to reflect on what barriers am I facing right now? People will often come up with images of mountains and images of gates being closed to them or images of dominating people and the chance to see that expressed outside of ourselves um, is not only useful as an artist but it can also be useful for people to do in their imagination as a way of gaining additional understanding of their inner world. So we worked together for six weeks in all of these ways and the PhD researchers who were trying to navigate the uncertainty of the times uh, discovered that not only were we in a pandemic, not only was their PhD overwhelming to them, but they also brought with them a whole set of insecurities that were challenging them from the inside to balance out with the outside. And together, we could identify with one another what those might be and how they actually shared them. And they weren't alone in that part of their journey, at least. And so it could be quite profound. So I'm using that example just to illustrate what I mean about providing structure and safety for people to use the creative arts in a way that might benefit their well-beings, as it could do for our students during the pandemic, but also to represent um, the kind of careful planning that you were demonstrating over cultural change over 25 years um, in really being targeted in being able to guide and companion people because um, not everybody is capable of holding everything that they discover artistically and in their imaginations. And they seek support from people who can understand that, not just verbally, but also creatively. So for that's, that's where the arts and wellbeing really land for me. It's like just thinking about safety and thinking about safety and thinking about safety, mostly. <laughs> Thank you.
Hello everyone. Um, as an artist, I'm really interested in the audience with my work. I care that they get something out of what I present to them. I invite them to create cultural meaning with me. I can't do it by myself. To do this, we need three components. We need the work, my intentions for the work, and then the viewer and their background. And with a work like the Skywell, creating connections with the community um, are key. So this is a project that I've been working on for 10 years. And these are two hot air balloons and they've gone all around the world and now they're going all around Australia. And um, here they are in Melbourne at Corbin Oval. And here is Jess. She's written the song for the Skyway. It's a, it's a big project. And I see it as an opportunity for people to experience things like awe and wonder and to come together and consider the values that we, sh that we might be interested in, like, um, like the wonder of nature and care. So. This three-way dynamic became evident and important to me when I ran an artist-run space in Melbourne during the early 90s. And I connected physically with people who came to the gallery. I would like it if my audiences were moved by what I create. I would love them to feel something, maybe even experience a shift in feelings or experience a transformative moment. That's probably the ultimate. There are so few opportunities in life to consider ideas as, as an audience, where we have a certain amount of space to engage our own agency and not be condescended to, food sped, or fed, sorry, food fed, <laughs> <laughs> or are manipulated into doing something like, like buying something. Um, the young family that I'm coming to soon, oh, I've got so many, <laughs> they really have been all around, around the place. Um, so the young family is a good example of a work that is both, both emotionally grounded, but also connected to contemporary ethical issues around genetic engineering. And here, here they are in Goma, and here they are in, um, in Canada. This work is about xenotransplantation, the idea of um, growing human organs in other species, and the opportunities for responsibilities that might arise for us to, um, um, yeah, be engaged engage with these animals, other non-human animals, um, and the sacrifices they make um, to make our lives comfortable or even possible. I think that one of the things that's characteristic of living a life today is that we don't know where the world is going to, what, what the world's going to look like in 2050. We don't know how the planet will change environmentally how the job market will be, or even how our bodies will function. And one of the ways which I feel my work contributes to the well-being of the audience is that I create a space where people can engage in difficult, often ethically oriented ideas in an open-ended way. What I believe is happening in society is that the rate of change is very fast and it's been driven by an elite group of people. And the people who are creating the algorithms that are shaping our society are acting without consultation with us. They have their own agenda and often that conflicts with the circumstances that most people face. And so, 
people feel disempowered by this. I know I do, and I feel very involved. So with my work, people get the chance to encounter and engage in a nuanced relationship with these ideas and ultimately develop a personal understanding. People want to be involved and, in the, and they want to engage in, with contemporary ideas. And these experiences can ultimately give people the agency to act on something that might be especially meaningful to them. So this work, Kindred, um, was a work that is um, inspired by the overwhelming feeling that I have about the possible, probable extinction of orangutans and the envir environmental crisis that confronts us. And so this is really a work about difference. Um, they're different from us. They're different from each other. But ultimately, if you spend time with the work, you realise that the work is actually about connection. And that's, that's their strength, that they have this. They have this intimacy and how, um, you know, how admirable that is to us and how beautiful that is. And, and, and I hope that it, it um, provides an opportunity for, to people to empathise and to connect with these, these feelings and ideas. And hopefully the work will hold us because often these feelings are overwhelming and they're very hard to, to bear. Thanks. Thanks, Patricia. Tiriki. Oh, hard acts to follow all. Thank you, but, and, but so much that resonates with me. Safety being such a big one, Cat, or this, the responsibility of the stories that we, that we carry, or how long we carry those for, thinking so far ahead into the future, that, that change and meaningful change doesn't happen quickly. It takes years and years, or indeed even generations, whether it be about how we, how we do it now, how we do it into old age and carry those stories. And I'm often put in mind of the privileges that I carry in this space. I carry tremendous amount of privileges. I grew up with a lot of heroes, a lot of heroes. And they weren't necessarily ones that I discovered myself, rather they were heroes that were given to me. They were gifts that were given to me. Whether it be through the sharing of stories, being exposed to extraordinary people and their extraordinary work. And it is indeed a bit of an interesting day for me today as I sit here having, uh, having lost a very close friend and, and great hero of mine just this morning, an Uncle Jack Charles. Someone who shaped my life in unexpected ways and so selflessly gave of their own experience that others may grow. But it was heroes like Uncle Jack and many, many others that were gifted to me throughout my life. Growing up as a young Aboriginal person in the outer eastern suburbs of, of Melbourne was an interesting space to be in. There were not a lot of other people like me around immediately. I would spend weekends exposed to cousins and extended family and so many of these heroes. I would sit in various fora such as this beside my father listening to people say inspiring things on stages. I was incredibly fortunate. And there were those heroes that were made for me as well. When I was four years old, my father, Lynn, who was an artist, a sculptor and painter, lamented the fact that there weren't 
any black superheroes for me to identify with. I asked my mother to sew me a Superman cape, which she did. She brought home some, some red felt from the kindergarten that she was teaching at <clears throat> and sewed me this cape. But then my father asked himself that question, well, why, why is there nothing there for Tiriki? And so him being a person he was made me my own superhero. He invented for me Captain Curry, a black superhero. He made the poster and everything, which... Uh, which is still my favourite piece of art that he ever, ever created. It follows me everywhere in life. And it wasn't long before, or it wasn't long after that, I should say, that uh, I started asking Mum to bring home red, black and yellow felt from kindergarten to make me a Captain Curry outfit. Increasingly, as I've travelled through life and I've been challenged by the viewpoints of those around me, by perhaps the narrow understandings that colleagues and friends and contemporaries have had in this space, those privileges are brought home to me again and again. And whilst the approaches that some people may have have at times even inspired me to, to anger and a modicum of aggression every now and again, well placed, I assure you, but at the same time, that is overcome with a tremendous sense of pity and grief for them. Because I realise that story of strength and vitality that was handed to me, I didn't realise it at the time, is something that has been largely denied to many of the people that I engage with. And I also acknowledge very fully that my experience as a Yorta Yorta and Jar Jar Wurrung person is not necessarily the stereotypical experience that many of my other First Nations colleagues and friends and family members have had. I grew up with that black privilege. I'm incredibly grateful for it. A friend of mine turned to me the other day. We were sitting here at the Willem Centre. They popped in during lunch and we sat there. They needed some, some pointers on some weaving that they were doing. And uh, knowing that I am a, a keen weaver from way back, I, I sat there and, and, and set them straight or as best as I could. And as they said to me, this is a person who's actively engaged in a lot of active healing work, extraordinary artist and, and collaborator, and turned around and said, it must be wonderful for you, you get to do this healing stuff all the time, it's somewhere safe for you to come back to. They went, huh. I'd never thought of it like that. Because for me, a creative and artistic practice has been handed to me by so many people around me, artists, activists who have chosen to make and unapologetically take and claim space Art and creative practice has, is not so much a shield as perhaps it is a sword in this regard. It is an opportunity to say, I am here, I am still here. For me, sitting and weaving is about doing something that my grandmothers and my grandfathers have done here in this place for thousands and thousands of generations. And despite two and a half centuries of, of impact on me, my family, our history, our knowledges, though that which we hold sacred, still I can do that. And perhaps more importantly now, I can redress the balance and the grief that I feel for others who haven't been exposed to these stories by sharing it on again. Safety is a big one. It's not just an unambiguous good, though, for me. It's not necessarily about what we learn, but perhaps about how we learn it. And when I look at my burrows, my kids, occasionally I'll pick them up and give them a shake, just gently. <laughs> I give them a little shake. and I'll say, You don't know how good you've got it. Because they don't. And to be perfectly honest, I don't know how good I've got it. And neither did my father or my grandfather and those generations that have gone before, at least for the last few. Because this notion of how we care for ourselves, how we care for country, how we care for place and how we hold 
precious the stories that speak for this place and how we make our heroes is not just about us in the here and now. It's about those many, many generations that are still to come and the work that we lay down. I'm really fortunate that I've been that close to my family and my ancestors and I get to keep telling their stories because I see that work that they have laid down generations before, people I've never met and will not meet whilst I'm here on this plane. I see their work and I get to embody that legacy. I dream of a space where we see the possibilities and the opportunities of celebrating and embracing those stories, all of us collectively, of creating a shared language where we get to celebrate and acknowledge our part, all of us collectively, in the longevity and the value and the thriving of these stories far, far into the future for those many, many, many generations that are still to come after. It's an exciting space to be in, but it does involve us shifting a few paradigms on their heads. It involves us asking where the authority of voice sits in the conversations. And frequently, if the answer to that question of where the authority of voice sits comes back to me, I find generally then I probably need to readdress the way I'm doing things because it really needs to sit outside of me and outside of this space. But I'm excited for these spaces that we create together. I'm excited for the way that we choose as artists to use our power to shape that world around us and to understand that it is a power and it's not necessarily just an unambiguous good that we get to decide. That's kind of a big deal. But there are very few people that get to decide what the world looks like, but we as artists do. And when we can decide what it is that's, that's healthy and which serves us all and where we can exercise our privileges in that space, it's going to be a pretty fun time, I think. Anyway, that's me. I think that's a really lovely way, Tiriki, to conclude the, the talks with that real sense of hope, actually, because it's quite easy, isn't it, when we're talking about well-being and we're very mindful of, um, you know, it's such, a, it's such a big topic and when we're so um, concerned with student well-being particularly um, and our own, it's easy to think that you know, it's, we're, we're all doomed. Uh, um, but actually, that, you know, so that, that really leads to a question around the future, actually. And I'm just picking up on, um, you know, Jane started talking about um, how in lockdown, these creative tasks really sustained people. And Kat talked about the, the power of, of, of music or dance uh, engagement with the arts. So this idea that in the last couple of years, maybe there's been a bit of a shift. And Sue spoke so much about, hope and how artists are now being really seen as athlete artists and there's a lot we can do through science and education to really push their sense of well-being and performance as well um, and I'm just wondering um, Patricia said a really lovely thing at the art forum actually that um, she spoke at the other week where she talked about how um, and I, I kind of remember it actually you said something about darkness follows when we refuse to care Darkness follows when we refuse to care. And I'm just thinking about the last couple of years in lockdown, how, um, how we became more concerned with our local area, didn't we? We got to see it more and experience it more. And so my question is really about that. It's about, and maybe Tuki, you could start by um, commenting on what, what the last couple of years did for our caring for each other, for self and for country. What good has come out of the last few years in terms of moving into a better future? In the second half of last year, I decided to start to... Well, we'd written it before, but we started teaching a new subject through the Willen Centre called Decolonising the Landscape. And the whole idea was going to be about getting students out, going out, we were going to use Google Maps and other mapping softwares to go out and start peeling back layers of knowledge. We're going to introduce students to all of the technologies and stories and histories of our broader community, starting to identify the plants which still grow out there within our landscape. Not necessarily just the bush foods that might grow, but what they can be 
used for the technologies living in those plants too. And we came into the start of, of semester two last year and said, look, we're in lockdown for a couple of weeks. Don't worry, we'll be back next week and we'll hook in. And week two came along and said, look, they've extended the lockdown for another week or two. Don't worry, we'll be back in. We've, we, we've, we've backloaded this, so in the second half, we'll get all the stuff done. It's great. Ten weeks later, at the conclusion of that semester, we said, look, we're sorry we've spent the entire time in lockdown. But all of a sudden, in that space, I've, there was this opportunity to start thinking in a very, very real and detailed and deep, multi-layered way about the significance of place and story. And here were students who were spread out across the entire continent who, had, who were reticent to come back to Melbourne because they didn't know if, if classes were going to start in person and it was smarter than not to. Reimagining their relationships with place talking about the significance of the stories and the significance of place for them, and these were largely non-Indigenous students, I think we had two out of roughly 30 students, who were now talking about what it meant for them to see their stories in this place and to understand they could no longer, they could no more extricate their stories from, from this place than they could the thousands of generations of stories that went before them as well. And that intimate relationship with place and space and country and the here and now, I think, was incredibly powerful. We, we had to be locked down to be, had to have that moment to pause and create that connection, to see students coming back with the same framework for work that we had designed to work over all of Greater Melbourne and beyond. They were boiling all of that down into a five kilometre radius and engaging with country and history in place. Then with their colleagues, they were starting to talk about the strength of the stories from the place where they were. Exchanging these stories, it was, this was a currency to them in that, in that space. In many ways, this was a tremendous gift to have time and space to be forced to stop and think. It was interesting having to write new subjects on the fly <laughs> every week. But I developed, having even lived, living, I've lived in the, in the foothills, the shadow of Korunwarabul, or Mount Dandenong, as it's incorrectly called, for the majority of my 41 years. I engaged with a narrative of a place that was, again, even to me, totally new and different and deep, and even the resources of place that I thought I had to go further afield for were, were right there. That question, I think, of how much we need and how extractive we are in a space comes back again and again. It's, it has been an extraordinary time, and I sincerely hope we don't lose some of the great lessons that we had the opportunity to learn there as well. Yeah, it's almost like localism was allowed to thrive. Absolutely, know? yes. Yeah. But yeah. it was also this, I mean, it was difficult but it, it afforded a kind of bridging that we don't normally do. So we reached out to people. We looked deeply into those screens and we sought connections and we pursued them in ways that we didn't previously do. And from that point of view, although it required hard work and a big conceptual shift, and people say it's not the same as being in real life, for many people who don't have those options of real life connectivity, it was a really powerful moment in history to make them more connected to other people. Now, how you de develop that and get the bonding, which is something that we got in place and you get the proximity and everything, is something that we might need to continue to work at. Um, but I, I've done a, a study during COVID looking at how artists were connecting globally and what strategies they were doing. And then networks continued to expand because the local wasn't possible. So it opened these new horizons and new conversations. Yeah, it's almost like we got in touch with our local area, but we also suddenly could reach very quickly and easily to our international yeah. colleagues and friends. 
What about, though, the connection to the body? I'm just thinking about the fact that, you know, our bodies became weapons, really, didn't they, during COVID? And, and how connected or disconnected we became with our bodies and other bodies. And I'm just thinking as a dance person, getting back into the studio was quite tricky. There was this distance, this space, you know, the whole question of, of touch. That's, that's interesting. Patricia, maybe you can pick up on, on any of that because we talked about that earlier. Uh, yes, um, during the lockdowns, we had the Skyrill performances um, in a few places, one of them in Melbourne, one of them in um, Hamilton. And there just seemed so much at stake um, during those performances uh, because um, we'd all been so um, isolated and, um, and in our own homes and to come out together um, in nature, in the dark, and to experience a spectacle um, and to feel it in our bodies um, with the music and, and just to feel the kind of um, wonder of it just was just... We really, really needed it to kind of co-regulate. Like how do we come down from all this heightened time um, and feel okay and safe with each other um, and with these ideas of the work? Uh, so, it, yeah, it was um, a really important time for me, that moment on Corbin Oval, because, yeah, he was my community. Um, and we were um, experiencing something together in real life. <laughs> you know, and the bats were over there roosting in the trees and the moon was up and then the sun came up and all these things that we even, um, we just, that are available to us, um, but not together, um, felt, felt good in, in, our, in, in our bodies. It felt so good and needed it so much. Yeah. Just shifting the topic slightly to student well-being, and I'm just thinking about um, Kat, a few things you said. Um, and as an educator, as an art school, um, do you feel like there's almost like a, a lag between um, us kind of keeping up in a way with the, the needs and the, and the, not demands of students, but the needs of students? Um, sort of they're shifting and changing so much and, and needing something quite different. And is there a sort of a... It feels like when you, you know, bringing up kids, you've got this six month lag when <laughs> the teenager becomes this new person, you sort of have to adapt and understand what their needs are. Can you speak a bit about that and about student wellbeing, particularly in, mm. is there a lag? Is that, is that something I'm just imagining? Yeah, look, I think that the pandemic really influenced <coughs> the ways that uh, people got bold in speaking to their mm -hmm. wellbeing needs. I mean, yeah. society was already moving in that direction and people are much more able to call out poor behaviour and to make demands that we might previously have gone in the arts industry at least. Oh, well, you know, as you were saying, just suck it up, sunshine. That's how it is to be an artist. So you just need to push on through. And I think students are definitely not willing to put up with that behaviour anymore. When I speak to student groups, they want to know how are they going to be able to work in industries that have no respect for boundaries or worse still abuse the power that they have in those industries. And uh, so their concerns are about not so much what they can um, get from us while they're here to meet their needs, but also about how am I going to be able to sustain myself in any of these careers going forwards, which have traditionally been based on self-sacrifice and pain and, um, and not taking care of oneself. So I do think that we're behind in meeting people's needs and I do get a bit resistive to the discourse, which is about people needing to be more resilient so the way that organisations such as ours cope with increased needs is to say, oh, well, we can't be delivering individual programs to everybody to help them with their needs. We'll have to think of something more global and we need to prevent, prevent so that we don't have these needs. But it, it's, mm. it's fair to say that young people are quite able to articulate that they do have needs right now and they would like yeah. help and, and how are we going to do it? But... Um, so I resist that resilience discourse and yet I do think that the arts are a fantastic form for addressing the core issues that people have around isolation and, and not feeling seen and heard and valued by everybody else around them and that when we come together and in a shared experience of the arts, like Jane's projects often are focused on and everybody's work uh, to a certain degree, then we can be with one another and transcend the differences that we all have 
and connect in our shared experience of, of an artistic moment. Uh, so I do think that we can contribute to building the community that supports people's individual needs, but I don't want to align with the, um, the discourse that we just haven't got capacity to do it any other way, I would say. It's really interesting, yeah. resilience as well, because we hear there's this presumption all the time that resilience is a good thing, we need to just, that's, that's what it's all about, that's what, we need students to be resilient. And, and actually, when you look at course documentation, you know, and, or graduate attributes, often you see that word resilient, don't you? Creative, versatile, adaptable, resilient. And um, that's just, particularly in an, in an art school, is that something we are striving for? Or actually are we, is it more nuanced than that mm. and complex? Mm. Yeah. yeah. Are there, I just want to now move to, to you all, um, amazing people. As I mentioned, you, you know, you've turned up presumably because you have perhaps something to say or, or this topic's important to you. Um, have you got some questions for the panel or a comment at all? And we've got some microphones, um, thank you, that can come and... and we'll keep the lights down, so yeah, thank you. Great questions. Thank, thank you all. This one. Keep speaking. Hello? Yeah. Yep, okay. Um, Thank you all, incredible evening, um, and thank you for hosting the, uh, this evening. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Tariki, you mentioned Jack, I was going to acknowledge uh, him as well. We've got uh, a colleague of mine, he's uh, an old friend of Jack's as well, and to, he's lost this, uh, today, he's, I'm sure felt by many. Obviously an artist in his own right. The other significant um, death we had this week uh, was Her Majesty the Queen, and uh, of course she, as may not be known, he was an artist in her own right, uh, a filmmaker, photographer, and for her whole reign of 70 plus years, a performer, a role that she played impeccably, um, <laughs> as we are obviously hearing. Um, for myself, um, uh, I, my name is Mark, I run the Australian National Veterans Arts Museum, our home is five minutes walk from here, um, and uh, Jane, your three predecessors were all on my board, um, so we'll need to talk one day. And, um, <laughs> and in fact, um, the first director, this I think is the 50 years of the VCA, the first director was a veteran um, himself. And um, uh, his name, uh, name escapes, me, escapes me in the moment. Um, Jericky, in terms of your work with the Willen Centre, obviously Richard Flank Franklin was a veteran. Um, and to your heroes, uh, um, William Barak, uh, again, is an incredible artist from the local area. Obviously, his portrait is on the building at the other end of Swanson Street, which is a tremendous tribute to him and his work as an artist in the local area. Uh, Patricia, I know your sister reasonably well. I speak to her often about uh, your work and her work and our work, and uh, they, they all do intersect, which is incredible. Um, and Kat, cast my mind back to 2016, we had our colloquium not far from here when uh, you launched um, uh, your work here uh, at the Catru. Uh, and Sue, your patron, uh, is the daughter of a veteran and the partner of, of a veteran, that's Lady Pin Pimrose Potter. And her support for the ballet is incredible. And uh, the work of, of uh, institutions like uh, the Australian Ballet and what they can do uh, in other sectors um, is just tremendous as well. Jane, you and I met a couple of years ago with your work. Um, and you're on the cutting edge and please continue that. And within our community, the veteran community, which is just a small subset of the broader community, and again, Her Majesty is a good example. Uh, older people in the arts are often veterans. Uh, the oldest veteran that I've come across was a practicing artist here in Melbourne. Uh, until recently, a couple of years ago, uh, Erwin Fabian, who was um, um, escaped from Germany pre-war and was uh, a member of the Australian Army for a couple of years. My uh, question to the panel uh, in the context of wellbeing, arts and wellbeing, is why is it so hard to get some cut through in the broader community and at, at government level? Um, in Victoria, we had the Royal Commission into Mental Health recently, uh, some recommendations coming out of that. We have incredible minds here and no doubt in the audience um, who are all believers and yet it is still so hard. How do we get some cut through so that we, from an arts and wellbeing context, uh, it is 
appreciated and um, accepted within society rather than on the fringes. Thank mm, you. Excellent question. Jane. Uh, call me naive, but I do feel <coughs> there's a little bit of hope. I think the fact that there's, um, you know, there have been white papers out there and there's been discussion opportunities and we're talking about a culture policy. Uh, the Australia Council has recently held a whole series of networked conversations and we've had opportunity to present. And you know that there are some governments in the world, including in the UK, actually encouraging strategies and policies around uh, creative activities for health and well-being. Um, so I have some hope. Um, of course, we have many examples of living cultural practices where you don't need a policy, it's there. And I think we've got a lot to learn from uh, Aboriginal Australian people who have been um, working in this integrated fashion for uh, generations. We, unfortunately, through um, some quirks of our histories, uh, white histories anyway, have lost some of that integration. And I, I uh, feel we've got much to learn from many different peoples. So I would feel a little bit of hope my fear is that um, the arts and health movement is becoming a little bit of a panacea and that everybody in any old corner of the street is setting up saying they're an arts and health expert. And I think we need to have some detailed conversations around that um, in terms of what they're promoting. So they're promoting things like care and offering safety, but in zones where those boundaries are quite difficult. So, um, yeah, that would be my little offering there. Thank you, Jane. Yes. Thank you all. Yeah, it's working. Right now. But, oh, hey. great, thank you. Um, thank you all. Um, I'm a first year PhD student uh, researching arts projects after disasters and how they help with social recovery and build psychological resi resilience. Um, and I just wanted to pick up on Kat's point about the resilience discourse um, and some of the more negative aspects of um, that in, in society, telling people to be more resilient. Um, how do you navigate the tension between that discourse and the resilience building aspects of arts activities, um, both as a researcher and from an advocacy point of view. Yeah. Yeah, I would totally agree that um, when used appropriately, the notion's quite beautiful and especially constructivist understandings of resilience that don't see people as individuals who build resilience up inside themselves, but rather build resilience based on their capacity to swim towards the resources that are made available to them or not and therefore we cannot locate that within individuals. So I think there's lots of great potential, but I do hear it being misused. And so I, I feel the need to um, usurp that desire for people not to have problems and, and, and to, to make sure that that doesn't happen whilst not taking any notice of all the oppressive structures that are, are creating it in the first place. So. I do think that, but yeah, you heard me, I'm compromised entirely because I think the arts are fantastic for coming together. And I think that, you know, we could sing a little bit of all we need is love right now if we feel like it, or, you know, that's what we're missing. It's a connection to one another. And there's something about when we sing that together, we feel that connection at the same time as share that vision. So yeah, I'm with you both. Good. Mm. Thanks. Just two more questions, great. Hi, um, so my, my question's for uh, Cherokee. Um, obviously, I think all of you are people who work with the youth a lot. Like, I'm a, I'm a university student. I go to VU. Um, that doesn't really matter. Um, oh, <laughs> I wasn't talking into the mic this whole time. Uh, and obviously, uh, Cherokee, you you're a great person to ask when it comes to like intergenerational, because obviously your dad, your granddad, and your grandma, no one talks about your grandma, um, lovely woman as well, but um, what, like I would like to know what you see 
in terms of a intersectional future for um, you know the youth of this country because obviously you know we're looking at a First Nations centered future but you know that's it's you know I, I just yeah what what you would like to envision mm -hmm. you, you you get what I mean okay <laughs> I think I do I think I do <laughs> and. It's a fascinating space. I, I, I had a meeting this afternoon where someone asked me, we're talking about cultural literacy training and how we, how we make more opportunities for people to become literate in these areas and learn more. And with all, of, oftentimes when people are doing, pardon me, consultations on these things, they'll ask, well, you know, what, what does success look like for you? And I hate that question because I never know the right answer in that space for me. And I've got, the, I've got the ones that I kind of feel, certainly. And when people talk about success in the, in the intercultural space, I talk about, well, I, I really hope that people are able to be immersed and understand and celebrate and see the relevance of the stories of this place in themselves to the, st to the point where there doesn't have to be a First Nations person in the room where they could sit down over dinner with their loved ones or families and, and say, I learned this amazing story about Bunwarang country or stories from this place today. It inspires me. Because I think well, oftentimes we think in, in binaries. We think in this binary of, oh, well, I can't, I can't engage because I'm told it's not for me. If I do, it's going to be appropriation and it's going to be extractive and that's going to be it. We don't often have stories about what we've missed out on in this space and how we can hear the authority of that voice. And I think for younger generations that are coming through, they're really feeling this more now. I see it with my kids. And a lot of the other young people that I, I work with as well, young university students who at this point who are, who are just kind of over all of the barriers that have gotten in their way, but they want to have a meaningful engagement. And I, I'm excited by that, because when I look back at the work that family members have done before me, and especially in intersectional space, and you mentioned, you mentioned <coughs> my grandmother, who's, who again, one of my heroes, crazy little Scottish woman who came from a very wealthy family, ran away, joined a communist party, married a black activist and got disowned, which were all sorts of things that I aspire to in many ways. <coughs> <laughs> this history of my own family is replete with people taking on these stories. You know, I, if, if I need to know a word in Yorta Yorta that I haven't memorised, there's a good chance I can jump on the phone and ring my partner, who will know. Now, she's the, this feisty five-foot-six little Welsh woman who has better grasp of the Yorta Yorta language than I do because they've had agency. And they were doing that long before we had kids together as well. I'm excited for our ability now to start tearing down walls that following generations will be able to not know were there <clears throat> or to break them down to the point where they're much easier to step over. Like I said, I don't think we're going to fix this now, but I'm really keen that one day my kids will look back at the stuff that I'm doing now and thinking it's, think it's very boring and pedestrian and not at all exciting because they'll be so far out there doing something else and hopefully they'll be they'll have a contemporaries and a community around them who want to do that as well and i think that's part of the work we do now is we have to do it knowing that we're not doing it for ourselves that we're not even doing it for one or two generations it, it's, it, it will be multiple but the great thing is there will always be work there'll always be something to do and we're never going to be bored because there's always going to be something new and exciting for us to take on. And that is, that, the, the lack of boredom is perhaps one of the greatest gifts we can give the generations that come after us anyway. Thank you, Taraki. I'm mindful of the time. Yes, last question. Thanks, Virginia. Yeah. Um, hi. Um, Patricia, I was in that park that morning and it was one of the most powerful arts experiences I've ever had. Um, and it's interesting how those sort of... We're seeing now people come back together and share experiences, the success of pub choir, et cetera. People want to be together and I think that goes to coming together and well-being, et cetera. 
One of the damages of COVID has been to artists and arts workers because during that time they were completely undervalued. Um, and I was wondering, and thank you to the panel, if the panel had a sort of comment on that, how do we repair that? And how do people actually want to work in this industry knowing that moving forward they are going to be valued? <laughs> great question. I mean, it's been great going to the theatre again and seeing that people still want live theatre, right? We don't want to just see it online. We want to sit like here and be together and share that live experience. So I'm also quite hopeful, but it, it feels like there might be a lag because people have left the industry, retrained. And so it feels like there might be a sort of, yeah, this moment where we, we have to wait and be patient, but it will be I think everyone will be coming back and that includes artists coming back to train and be educated. As long as we've got the right governments supporting uh, the arts, then and that it's a possibility and it's accessible to all, then I'm, qu I'm quite hopeful. Does anyone want to add? I think it's unknown and difficult. Mm. But I think the point I made earlier, I think it has been a financial disaster for artists and I concur with all that you say. And I think, you know, there's a question about why and how are students coming back to study as well as they're enthusiastic to. But I think on the positive, it's been one of those forced fissures or ruptures that has and will lead to some new and exciting directions. We might not quite know what they are yet, but despite all the bad things about the online experience, it's had some benefits as well. Thank you. We need to start wrapping up. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Of course, it can go on forever and ever, but I feel like we're going to pick up on some of these points actually at the next talk. Mm -hmm. So if you enjoyed this one, please come to the next. It's on the 11th of October and it's um, celebrating intersectionality and inclusion in the arts. Um, I'd like to thank our panel of speakers for their fantastic contributions. We've got a few little gifts that Tracy's going to give out. So thank you to Jane, Sue, Kat, Patricia and Tiraki. Tracy. Different. I didn't want to mix Thank you. <laughs> and please um, join us if you like for a drink. Um, just a quick drink before you head off, if you if you like outside. Thank you very much for coming. Before we go, I just wanted to say, and I'm pretty sure I'm representative of a few different people to one degree or another. Thank you, Emma. Yeah. You bring people together and you get us having important conversations and it's so great, great to be under your leadership. Thank you, Kat. I really appreciate that a lot. Thank you. Thank you.